Um, so chairing our panel today is Catherine, um, who leads on Faith Invest program on faith beliefs, teaching and values. She worked with the Irish Jesuit province at the Newarks of Faith and Environmental Justice and has formation experience in ecology and spirituality, um, Catholic social teaching and care for the earth. An environmental professional um, with extensive experience in mixed methods research, policy development, program management and evaluation, strategic communication and stakeholder engagement. She has lectured at University College Dub Dublin um, on environmental issues and published in leading international journals on environmental policy, interreligious dialogue and sustainability. So I think after all of that you can agree she is a very, very well matched chair for this panel. <laughs> thank you Catherine. Uh, uh, yeah, I hope so. Um, <laughs> thank you so much Julia and thank you. I hope everybody had a had some nice refreshments. Delighted to be here to chair our um, third panel, second panel of the day on church investors in climate solutions. Delighted to be joined by Mike and Paul. Um, and you will find that if you read the church investments in climate solutions financing liberal future report on your table from Operation NOAA that they feature um, in that report as case studies. Just, just very briefly before I introduce our two panel members, I think listening to this morning, all I was really struck by that I think will speak to this panel. So this idea of what can we do within our scope, breaking down silos, scaling up, getting into the practicalities. I also love this idea of cathedral thinking, um, living within our boundaries, what is enough, what is plenty, particularly within the context of risk and return. Some of that is going to come up, I think, in this panel, so I'm particularly excited. Um, just before I do hand over, I'm going to very briefly introduce our, our two panel members. Um, Mike Sturgis from the Diocese of Truro. Mike is the chairman of the Truro Diocesan Board of Finance. Um, the Diocesan uh, Truro Diocesan Board of Finance is the legal entity that deals with the financial and admin aspects of the diocese in the Church of England. It receives income from and on behalf of parishes as well as from other sources. It employs lay diocesan staff, pays clergy stipends, owns the clergy, clergy parsonages and glebe land and manages investments. As a member of the Bishop's Diocesan Council, Mike is the director of the company. He's responsible for presenting the annual budgets and financial results to the Diocesan Synod. Um, previously, Mike was the chairman of SWAT UK, joining SWAT UK in 1983 um, and taking over as MD in 1986 before moving into the chairman role. SWAT UK Limited helps accountants become compliant, efficient and profitable. Paul Jaff is the head of ESG for Real Assets with the Church Commissioners for England. Um, he oversees the ESG related activities for the Church Commissioners property, land and infrastructure investments, working closely with the responsible investment team. Um, in Paul's previous role at British Land, he oversaw the execution of placemaking and environmental initiatives and community projects across a 1.8 billion campus in the West End of London, helping bring parts of the campus to bream outstanding standards. Um, Paul um, has also served as a fund manager director at LaSalle Investment Management, and he's a chartered surveyor with a master's degree from Cambridge Institute for Sustainable Investing or Sustainable Leadership. So, um, what I'm going to do, first of all, is hand over to you, Mike. I would very much like you to very briefly um, introduce yourself and tell us just a little bit more about the Diocese of Truro. Hi, so I'm Mike Sturgis. Um, SWAT, by the way, SWAT UK has nothing to do with special weapons and tactics. It's all to do... <laughs> but we did get some amazing emails from kids in America. Um, what weapons do you use? And when I say the laptop, wow. Um, so the Diocese of Troyes is a small diocese. It was carved out of the Exeter Diocese. This is Church of England. Um, we have an annual income of about 7 million and expenditure of about 9 million. And if you know Mr. McCorber, you think, okay. But our net assets have grown from 40 million to 121 over the last 20 years. So we're actually, for a small diocese, very asset rich. Um, and we do own, so the glebe land is, is stuff that we stole from the parishes, as I'm regularly told, um, and is used to pay the stipends, and we own the houses. So there's quite a lot of, uh, lot of stuff in, in there about that. Thanks, Paul. Oh. Uh, uh, th thanks, all. Uh, so so I'm, I'm Paul, so um, th thanks for the, the bio. That, that, that's really um, better articulated than I would do for myself. Um, 
And so a little bit about the, the church commissions, just to, I guess, anchor some of the, the questions, um, as we are often uh, assumed to be part of other church entities, or uh, and you know, we, 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 we see the sort of the conflation between us and the, the Church of England. So uh, the Church Commissioners is effectively the endowment fund for the, um, sorry, Church Commissioners is the endowment fund for the Church of England. So we've got a responsibility to effectively maintain uh, wealth, to uh, then provide distributions that go um, back to the Church of England to support their mission. Um, we are um, effectively a perpetual fund, so we have to keep that wealth and, and, and grow it. Um, and then the, the distributions go to, to, to say supporting various activities. Um, we're a we're a charity. Um, we have therefore a financial obligation to achieve best value um, and to make decisions that effectively are financially led. So all that we do in the uh, in the kind of responsible investing still has to sit within that within that context. Um, and that's, a, I guess, an important part of of, of how we we have um, how we've organised ourselves. Um, maybe just to, again to sort of anchor um, the the conversations. We have a a net zero target of twenty fifty. Uh, that is different from the the Church of England's operational and, and owned assets. Um, and I'm, there'll probably be a chance to talk about that in in a bit more detail. But the the view we have taken as investors. Um, in, in short, would be that we want to work with companies that are Paris aligned for a 2050 target, um, and we want to um, invest in a universe that sees a. Um, I guess we have a portfolio that is um, supporting real world change rather than just a net zero portfolio. So I hope that helps as a, a sort of anchor for, for, for subsequent. Thank you so much, Paul. Uh, Mike, I'm going to start with you. Um, so the Diocese of Truro reviewed its investment policy in 2020, uh, but at the time it made a decision to, to go beyond the ethical investment policy of the Church of England's Investment Advisory Group. I would love to you to share with the room um, if you can tell me more about the thinking that led to that decision and why that motivation was there to actually go further um, to the guidelines that you initially adhered to. Um, we have an investment policy, as you would expect, and we incorporated into that policy the concept of kingdom values, where we actually acknowledge that we want to invest in what is right for the church and not just look at this as an investment portfolio to maximise. So we acknowledge and accept that we could take higher risk for potentially lower rewards uh, if it was aligned to what we're doing. Um, and we have an investment policy, which is to cherish creation, cut carbon, and speak up. And from that, we were looking at these together and saying, right, we, we need to actually back what we think and put our money where our mouth is or take our money away from where we think it shouldn't be. And so we, we went for an active policy of disinvesting. But one of the other things I would like to say, it's not in our policies, but I would summarize it is first do no harm, then do some good. And so the first point was disinvesting from fossil fuels, but the next one was to actually invest in renewables. Uh, it didn't start out as a particular, we're going to invest in renewables. We were looking at an alternative to bonds and we started investing in some infrastructure, one of which happened to be a renewable company and we've the first million went that way later on we invested another three quarters of a million um, and those were into three renewable projects um, uh, I mean I think we talked a little bit later on about the other the other process but it was very much first do no harm then do some good excellent and, and do you want to align more on the on the steps you mentioned kind of from divestment and then doing into the do good just even in terms of the kind of internal steps as a diocese and um in terms of you know um aligning your policy and so on tell us a little bit more about those practical steps um i think this the starting point was very much we want to look at alternate and, and diversify our portfolio we had, a, um, we had two main fund managers, many of you will know CCLA was a standard one, that was our main one, and we'd, we'd gone with M&G Charifund, and we'd been talking to M&G Charifund about um, them, you know, are you going to offer us a, a non-fossil fuel option? And they'd been saying yes, 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 and then they said no, it's not going to happen. 
Um, and at that point, we said we are going to sell their MNG. So we sold all of those. We told them why we're selling. That you know you're not giving us what we need. We either had to change our principles or change our fund managers. So we chose the latter. Um, we went out to look at other fund managers. We interviewed two. We liked them both. So instead of putting the five million um, that we were going to put in, we we sold some more shares. Um, investments and gave them each five million and those were again high ESG um, sustainability fund managers and so it was it was really a process that um, I don't know that we ever sat down and said this is where we're going but it was very clear from our conversations that that was where we were heading and it evolved over a couple of years to get to where we are now and now about 10% of our um, investments are in renewables now, I'm excluding the housing, I'm excluding the Glebe land, although we do look at what we can do with that, but this is 39 million of, of investments on the market, 10% is now in, in renewables. Fantastic, thank you so much. Um, Paul, so given the size of the, the Church Commissions of England, um, you can be very much, I suppose, regarded as a, an, an aspirational role model and, and uh, kind of a leadership in terms of ethical investment. Um, Paul, I, I know you are the head of sustainability uh, for, for real assets, but if you take a step back for a moment, can you share with us um, or can you share with the room um, an overview of the church commissioner's approach to, respond to responsible investing in climate solutions? Thanks. It's, it's interesting. I'm sorry I couldn't make this session previously, but hearing some of the, um, the themes that, that came out about... Um, working within your scope, I think, are, are, are really interesting. So I'll, I'll, I'll sort of allude, uh, go through how we've organised our thoughts. But just to start, we, we obviously, um, well, firstly, to say we really appreciate the comment of how we're seen, because that mean we work incredibly hard as a, as, a, as a team to try and work out how we do the right thing and, and what the right conversations are. Um, I guess historically, the way that, ethical investment would have been is you're either invested or you're not so exclusions um you know s selling selling out of assets um and that's something we we obviously still have as a um as an option um when you think about one our fiduciary duty but actually you can put that to one side and say two-thirds of emissions are caused by the top 100 companies the question is do we feel that we are in a better position to be part of those conversations to have engagement ownership um, work with peers to try and affect change or in some cases is it better to say do you know what actually we don't feel this is the right so we have exclusions um, most of which will be known but I guess the most recent is coming out of oil and gas, and that was effectively on the back of a, um, a, a five to six year engagement program, starting with Exxon, um, where effectively you came to a point of saying, we just do not see close alignment on, you know, and we believe you have the scope and influence to do so. So for that reason, we, we came out um, relatively publicly. Um, around that, we have processes and policies that I'm sure people can, can access um, and, would, and would expect of us. Um, but just to say about how we organize our thoughts around it, because I think that's important. We do try and take, I guess, a, a, you know, a, um, an accessible approach that's grounded in common sense and that I could explain to my kids, um, where I think our focus is on saying, what are our key spheres of influence. So I think that was what was touched on in the, in the previous session. Like where can we make a difference? How do we do it? What actions can we take that make real world change? So we, own, we um, in the real asset portfolio have lots of dairy farms. Um, dairy is a high emitting sector. Do we sell them or do we say actually our responsibility is to work with our farmers and understand what we can do to reduce those emissions, get methane capture, find where nature recovery should be. And we, that, that's the view we've, we've generally take, um, we generally take, and, and to operate within a, a world that says that long-term stewardship and value are linked. We might lose out in the short term, but long-term, these, the, these are the right ways to, to do it. So, um, yeah, I hope that that's a, Hard to, to capture everything, but I hope that helps. 
Uh, yeah, no, thank you. Thank you so much, Paul. I'd love if you could speak a little bit more about the kind of the values and the mission and how that's integrated within the investment. I, I think I was doing some background reading on the church commissioners and I was really struck by um, the, the, the theme around systemic risk and not just risk in, in the sense of investments, but also risk in terms of delaying credible climate action, um, the risk of investing in um, certain, you know, uh, pollution activities uh, and so on. Do you, do, could you speak a little bit about that? Um, that kind of, you know, you've also, you, you've mentioned stewardship, but are there other kind of values that, that influence um, the Church Commission's um, investment strategy? Yeah, um, so, I mean, systemic risk is a, is a really interesting, you know, in, in broad terms, I, I view, we view systemic risk as a way of saying, you know, we can't just use blunt instruments. We have to look at the ways in which companies we invest in, land that we own, um, houses that are built have knock-on effects. So how you measure that and boil it up into one number is difficult. Um, and I think we are increasingly getting comfortable with saying it is difficult. Like people expect a number, you know, you have achieved X. And actually, that can be really hard if you don't have a number to, to how, do you, how do you justify it? Um, some of the ways I guess we would deal with the systemic risk um, outside of real assets would be, can when we engage with large companies, can we bring out their human rights policy? Can we have their processes? Might that lead on a large social media company to them having policies in place that help with safeguarding and actually therefore have a knock-on effect to how you know children you know access social media you know those are the things that you know we can't measure uh, as to results but are but ones we feel is worthy of our time um, and I guess we take a similar approach on real assets so when we have land that we're developing for housing we know that our skill set is not building houses we're not going to be house builders, but how can we shape the way that land gets planning consent? How can we shape the sale process so that when houses are built, the values are locked in um, and, and shaped for the next generation and the, the generation after that? You mentioned, I mean, we've been talking about impact and this morning you've mentioned measurement and I would love to know more a little bit about um, how you how you measure the actual environmental and kind of social impact of the of, of real assets? You mentioned dairy farming as well. Do you want to speak a little bit more about maybe some of the challenges before I move to Mike around measurement and so on? Uh, yeah, thanks, Catherine. So when I joined, I guess as, as I said, like I would have, you know, what's what's the aspiration? Well, it's to have carbon data, you know left, right and centre that you're sitting there tracking minute by minute and seeing it come down nicely. We actually, uh, and this is before I joined, had done a really good job of, of understanding our footprint, you know, in rough terms. And I sort of helped pull that together to, to stand back and look at it, which effectively said, we don't, well, we don't know how much our, our farmers are emitting because actually the calculations are really difficult. You know, how much, if you even take something like compost, is that an emitter? Is it a sequester? Is it neither? You know, and you've asked people to effectively start calculating this on scale relating to a farm. It's really hard. Um, but we've got to do something. Um, so one, I think the, the education piece is to say, we need, you need to understand roughly what you're looking at, um, which I think we did a really good job of. Um, you then need to work with your stakeholders to say, look, this isn't going to just come down overnight. You know, unless we sell, um, and that doesn't change the act, that doesn't change anything in the world. That just changes our portfolio. Um, so the question I then would say, well, we we accept we want to see change. How do we measure it if we can't we can't just say sorry, we're not looking at carbon anymore, right? Um, so actually, what we're in, in, trying to do is create other data points that we think are really helpful to articulate what our farmers are doing. So we're undergoing at the moment, uh, we've got 400 farming tenants, 130 equipped farms, so they have lots of um, equipment on, on farms. Um, we're trying to survey as many of them as we can to ask them a range of questions that help show what they're doing. So we're already, you know, we're early on, but we're, we're seeing roughly half are doing a carbon audit. So, and 
those who've done more than one are seeing reductions. Can I bubble that into our number? No, but I can show direction of travel. When they're planting trees, are they interested in biodiversity? Yes, what are they doing? Well, they're putting in more field margins, they're planting hedgerows, we're getting that data. And we think those are the sorts of things that will help give us confidence and, and identify areas where things aren't going as we'd hoped. You know, are, they, are they engaging in government schemes, uh, you know, uh, stewardship schemes, or are they not? If not, why? Mm -hmm. Knowledge, can we help with knowledge? Funds, can we help with funds? Um, yeah, so it's, uh, it's <laughs> I'm sure others will have views, but it's not easy to mm -hmm. bubble it to a number. I think we're getting comfortable with that. Yeah, um, I mean, so we have land as well, and we've got sort of 19 million pounds worth of land, so not quite in the same league as we've got on the church commissioners, and it tends to be a field over here and another field over there, and it's, it's a field that's rented by this farmer and that, as part of a bigger farm. And we've, all of the, um, all of the committees at the Diocese of Truro feed back into the Environment Board um, on a quarterly report saying this is our part of getting to the environment goals and this is what's happened in this quarter these are the challenges and when we've looked at glebe land and trying to calculate our footprints we basically said there's no point in us even trying at the moment because we don't know how to do it and until we get some national guidance we'll just be inventing a wheel and it'll probably turn out square so we're kind of putting that on hold until we f get feedback from the National Church. But we are managing our, so we have 63 of our 121 million is in housing. And we're very much looking at our housing stocks. We've got a house next to a field that's owned by us. We're saying what, what are our opportunities there. So all of our Glebe land is split down by strategy. As, um, is it open, potential open market down the line? Can we use it for renew, um, affordable housing? Can we look at it for renewable projects? And we have looked at that and mapped all of our land against the grid. So we're working our assets quite hard um, to try and achieve that process. But it is it's difficult. Um, and trying to get a carbon footprint on your investment portfolios, we've, we've got three funders. One of them is excellent and gives us it absolutely. Another one is sort of gives us it, and the third one isn't giving it us. And the, you know, that's one of the pressures that we're going to be putting on them. And we haven't even thought about how we measure biodiversity and the impact our investments have got on biodiversity. You know, that's, let's sort carbon out first, that's the easier one. Um, but it, they're, all in our, they're all in our thoughts. Um, but we're a small diocese, and we've got a, an investment committee of six people that meets quarterly. You know, th this is not something that we're able to take up on our own. We have looked at planting woodlands but our land is too small to be of interest to the to the the agencies that do that and we don't have the resources to manage woodland ourselves so we have to look at other things but we are doing that and and that's something that I do want to touch on but just i mean the conversation around um you know balancing returns or the need for returns um, I was really struck by this concept of, of spiritual return this morning but I'd love to get a little bit more insight from both of you on on how you how you how you balance or if you balance or if that's something that you're constantly trying to navigate as faith investors you start I'll follow <laughs> <laughs> thanks Mike um, I so our constitution, you know, effectively has certain ways we can operate that are outside of a fiduciary duty. Generally, they are related to ethical restrictions. So as a general point, I would say you can look at it through either lens and come to the conclusion that what we are looking to do is, is appropriate. And I think that generally the conversations we have internally go from a how does this affect real world change how and are our assets performing and likely to perform for the long term so if you look at our farmland if we if we didn't invest and engage in our farmland and we just left it and the soil got worse and we weren't engaged you know we weren't doing the things around that you know not only are we creating a 
problem that is a societal problem. We're also creating an asset that is not performing. So I do think that it's helpful for us and I guess for, I guess for others um, to be able to, to, to see that alignment and that you're not having to do something purely from a, a, a spiritual perspective. Um, it does mean that maybe unlike how Mike has been able to organize the constitution that, you know, we are not impact investors and we, you know, there are things we would like to do that we, that if we did would mean we were effectively distributing less money. So that's, that's going to always be a trade off that we have. And I think it would be reasonable to say that, that in the eyes of some, and these are valid stakeholders, you know, they would, they would want us to do things, you know, that, perhaps went up further than, than we feel we can within our constraints. Um, but I think it's okay to say that the, the general principles of long-term stewardship and investment are, 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 are well aligned. Um, yeah. Thank you. Yes. Um, I think when we look at the way we are operating, we are quite happy with the concept of investing our reserves. Our reserves have grown well over the years. Um, I, I mentioned earlier we were about 7 million income, 9 million expenditure, and most people sort of all like that. But actually, we may have to be running an operating deficit, but our balance sheet's been increasing year on year on year. Uh, when we look at some of the uh, issues that we're facing with, with our Glebe land, uh, and you look at it as a pure return on investment, our, our Glebe land gives us a return of about half a percent to 1%. Typically, we would be looking for a 3 or 4% margin coming out of it. But that misses the point that actually we need to look at our land on a total return basis because every now and again, we sell a piece of land for a couple of million here and that one for three. And a, a piece of land that was of no real special value sold for three quarters of a million a couple of years back because there was a special interest buyer who live next to that and wanted to expand onto that land. So when you look at the portfolio as a whole and over the years, then actually our land is good. And we want to stay in land. So we were actually looking the other day, um, literally a couple of months ago, we bid for a piece of land. It's the first time we've actually gone out to buy land rather than just you know, selling off what we'd got to, to make good money. Because we feel that's, that's part and parcel of the future. We have a strategy that we're taking to Synod, our Darson Synod, this month, where we are saying we want to invest 22 million over the next 10 years in our mission, in our ministry, and in net zero. And to put that into perspective, that's out of a total of 121 million. So that's a sixth of our investments. We are looking at investing over the next 10 years in the mission and ministry. But we don't actually expect our balance sheet to go down because we think it will continue to grow. And, and what we've seen is that actually investing in our ministry pays, and investing in mission pays, and we can see the returns. I'm really grateful for the church commissioners, because my own church is in receipt of money from the diocese and the, and the church commissioners um, to grow our church. And we are growing our church. You know, we've gone from two kids when we started to 40 kids. And it's, it's great to see that, I mean, the, 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 it's chaos at the beginning of the service before they go out, but it's fantastic to see. And to be honest, without investing in mission through the diocese and the church commissioners and others, we would just see continuing congregations going down. We need to be doing that. So we, you've got to put your money where your mouth is. And if we talk about Jesus and the love of God in the faith, we actually need to do that. If you're just saying net zero, I have people complaining about net, why are you spending, we're planning to spend three million on net zero over the next, over that, that period. And a lot of that is to, to get our housing stock up to, to you know, net zero. And they say, why are you doing this? And you say, well, because we cherish creation and we want to cut carbon and we want to speak out about it. You know, you can't have a strategy of saying we're going to be as a Church of England net zero by 2030 which is a really ambitious target, by the way. You know, we're going to struggle to do it, but I'd rather they set it at 2030 than 2045, because then everybody say, oh, we've got time. So actually, go for it. But if you've got a strategy and you won't put any resources to it, then it's just wishful thinking. It's not a strategy. And that's what we need to be doing. 
And you've mentioned a key word, resources. And I'm conscious that when we were having kind of a preparation call for this panel, you were both in agreement that resources and internal resources can be quite a challenge. And Mike, you've already outlined the level of resources within your diocese that have gone into making these investment changes over the past number of years. Do you want to tell me a little bit about the resource challenges and, and how they've been overcome within both organizations? Um, certainly, so we are, as I said, a small diocese, very small team uh, at, at Church House. The investment committee is all made up of volunteers, apart from the director of finance and asset and the diocesan secretary sits on the committee as well, and we meet quarterly. Now, you cannot ma actively manage funds on a quarterly basis, so we, we outsource it. We outsource our land management and our housing to Savills. And because they do both, that means they can be strategic about where the, the two align um, with, with opportunities. But we can't actively manage stuff on a day-to-day -day basis. So we have to use external resources. Um, but within that, we can operate very well and be quite, we can be quite innovative and nimble within the concepts of the Church of England, anyway. <laughs> Uh, that's really interesting to, to, to hear, and I mean, I, I suspect that, well, the church commissioners is larger, we, we have more resource, um, but I'd say probably a lot of the themes are the, are the, are the same, um, and I guess everyone always wants more help and more resource. Um, the question would be, what would you do with it if you had it? Um, and that's, that's, never, that's never an easy one to, to you know, to have unlimited resource to do the things but just you know say we have 400 farming tenants we've got a team of um four or well, four and a half asset managers who work on that they went to go and see over half the um, equipped farm tenants last year to meet with them that's a huge amount of you know you add all the the hours up that's a huge amount of time and their job is asset management you know to effectively to, to create you know and preserve wealth and to you know so they're doing this, you know, in addition to their, their day job. And every time, you know, a, you know a, a stakeholder has a, you know, something they need from us or don't like, you know, we have to, you know, we, we take the decision. We want to, to react to that. Um, so that, that's incredibly rewarding and draining. Um, and people are very grateful. But um, there's always more you'll want to do. Um, I think then... Maybe just to also say, in terms of what we do around that, it is where can we make the biggest difference? So we're saying, you know, we know that lots of those small things will add up to big, to, to bigger and better things. That engagement is important, but also we have to look at, you know, how much renewable energy can we get on our land? You know, that those, you know, so we have a we have a wind farm that's gone into some of our forests, which is capable of avoiding. 200,000 tons of emissions every year. Um, so just to put that in context, we think our farming portfolio is emitting 100,000 tons. So they're not, you know, whose emissions are they, I don't know. But the point is, if you can get your time onto those things and you know, an anaerobic digester that takes uh, cow dung and puts it in and rather than go into the atmosphere it goes into the grid you know those are the things we're trying to, to do around those challenges you know where can we where can we make the, the, the biggest the biggest difference um, as well as invest in you know climate solutions like renewable energy you know directly wind farm directly um, so we, that we we can't just be a, an infinite resource to, that drains on on, on, um, on other on other things. Thank you so much. Uh, before we, I'm just keeping an eye on the clock, before we hand it over to the floor for questions, I do have a kind of an ideal vision wish list question to, to wrap up. Um, if you were to outline your ideal vision or your priorities for your investments in a way that would align with climate solutions, what would be on your wish list? Mike. If I start with the wish list, then um, that Synod approves the 22 million over the next 10 months in about two weeks' time. Let's go with the quick and easy one, I hope. Uh, I hope. Um, I would love to see fund managers 
reporting on carbon in a consistent way that we can actually, when you several, we've got several fund managers, we get the data in the same way so that we can amalgamate it. Um, you talked about using your land for renewables. We have mapped all of our land against the grid in Cornwall. The grid in Cornwall is rubbish. <laughs> um, and we've identified potential schemes, but the grid capacity is not good enough to be able to deal with them. Um, and it's probably going to be at least 10 years before it is. And so if we as a country are going to go down and try and become renewable and everybody's going to be moving to electric cars and all of this, then we've got to sort the grid capacity out in our country. We've got to invest in that because without that, again, we're into wishful thinking. And there's so much more we could be doing. So I would love to see a situation where you know, the, the diocese is actually generating large amounts of electricity or the land is being used to generate it. Because like you, we don't build houses. We sell land for affordable housing or for open development. We wouldn't actually build the wind turbines or the solar farms. We would actually have an agreement. This is the land. Can you put it on there? And we were looking to, you know, is there battery storage? I was talking to somebody um, earlier on in the week, um, or last week rather, and about putting battery storage in. And he was really just dismissing it. Oh, no, no, that's not the way to go. The way to go is going to be through um, putting stuff into, you know, pumped gas down that, you know, you can compress it and then release it, this sort of thing. And I'm saying, yeah, but that's, that's, that's technology that doesn't exist at the moment. So it's a little bit like we were hearing earlier about this um, fossil fuel saying, no, we're going we're gonna to do this down the line somehow. We've got to work on what we've got at the moment and deal with what we've got at the moment. And by the time we get these fancy things for storage, those batteries will be dead anyway. <laughs> oh, sorry. Uh, no, that, that's really interesting. And um, I probably have grid on there, uh, the, the, the accessibility of the grid. Um, I mean, I, I answered uh, sort of in thinking about this, I, was, I thought um, in an ideal world, it would be that there is a, a level playing field for climate solutions and that the um i guess the true cost of you know whether it's food production or energy production you know that is actually reflected in the price that a consumer ends up paying for it um and i think around that without looking to be political um certainty is really important so that people have rules that they understand that are coming down the line that then don't get changed that I can think of some um, because I think then investors can invest and we you know we made a you know a public a sort of announcement that we did you know we didn't see you know the recent changes um, in relation to you know um, EPC legislation boilers and housing you, know, you you have you have a private sector that is in, incredibly important to the transition and they're there and they're willing to invest but they need to know what the rules are otherwise these things can fall through um so that would be my that would be my um broad wish list if that makes if that makes sense yeah that's excellent and and what i'm really struck by is um you know obviously in addition to investments using the range of levers that faith-based organizations have at their disposal to enable that environment of certainty and, and regulation. I think we probably touched on that as well this morning. So, so thank you to both. I think we can probably, ha will we hand it over to questions from the floor? Paul Whitehouse, Quakers in Britain. Uh, just a question I suppose to Mike on the point he made about batteries. Uh, yes, I agree. How do you ensure that the batteries you purchase are not being constructed from minerals extracted in places where there is very, very substantial exploitation of people, including children? Thank you. Yep. Um, there, there, there's two points I want to make, so hopefully it's okay to do two things. Um, I'm Rebecca Warren. I'm, I'm a board member of, of, of um, Operation NOAH. I'm also a for, former board member of, of um, Share Action, which I'm sure some of you have heard of. Um, yeah, first point I want, want to make is um, in, in, in response to what Paul said about engagement. Um, I think, I think um, engage, engagement falls at two extremes. You can you uh, to um, influence. A, um, well, I'm talking here about about investing in companies, not about investing in farmland directly. Um, but investing in companies, um, you, can, you you don't need a financial interest in, in um, a company to to um, influence it. You only need one share, 
and I know that because I've done it. Um, I've got one share in BP. There's a very long story behind it, but I managed, just with that one share, I managed to get them to change their climate change policy. Um, so, so um, well, hold that thought. But um, at the opposite extreme, if you um, have got a very large, if you own a significant part of the company, or if you can collaborate with other organisations which do, and, you can, and you've got control of about, say, about um, 10 to 20% of the company, that's enough to make the, the members listen to you. But in between, and that's where most people are going to be, um, you can't really influence the company. So um, I think um, if, if you're um, thinking, to, if you've got, if you're in a tiny proportion of a company and you're thinking in terms of engagement, you're probably better off just um, keeping that one share and getting rid of the rest of it. Um, so that was one point I wanted to make. Um, the other one, um, and this um, responds to, this is something I've been thinking about all day and um, also responds to um, Mike's point about, about, about fi finding new, new, um, um, new, new fund managers for your, for your money. Um, well, obviously, you, have, you do actually have quite a large fund. I mean, you keep saying it's not very big, but you do have a large fund. You, you are in a position to, to um, do, do all, your, all your research into um, how to invest your money. But where, where, where does that leave um, a retail investor or, or um, a very small organization which perhaps has an endowment of £1 million? Um, they, they don't have time, time to do the research themselves. Um, and, and so um, I, think, I think something we're crying out for is, is um, some sort of off-the-shelf off solution um, whereby... Um, so someone with a very small amount of money, money to, to invest can actually invest it in, in a, a way which, 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 which um, meet, meets our environmental and ethical criteria. And I'm, I just think, I've been, I've been banging about, on, on, about this for years. Is it too much to ask for that? Perhaps the point is that it isn't clearly defined and um, the, the rules aren't clear enough either. Thank you. Neither of you said anything about the insurance industry. And I'd be interested to know how it impacts the decisions you make about investment, um, say an issue of church stock, or do you invest any money in climate advocacy, since your land, your housing must be very much affected, you know, when you look at the projections into the future on the climate crisis. So insurance, say something about that. And just riffing off your wonderful question about insurance, have any of you thought about uh, the risk of climate litigation? So we have a court case in France at the moment against BNP Paribas using vigilance law um, for uh, effectively abuses of environmental and human rights through their lending and investment decision-making process. And we're seeing huge, huge developments in climate litigation and law aimed at those facilitators of the businesses, i.e. the funders. Um, it's interesting when you start to think about then the wealth owners who are agreeing to the strategies that their investment managers are putting in place and the risk, therefore, that they potentially are running um, with regards to litigation, um, which since 2015, we've had a two and a half X increase in climate litigation globally. Um, so really interested in your views there on climate litigation as well. Um, I was trying to see if I remember all of the, all of the questions. It started off with batteries. And, and how do we know that um, we're, we're getting good batteries and not bad batteries? And I'd just like to get some batteries at the moment. But I, I, I had a question very similar to that when I was looking at we're looking to put solar panels on our, our church hall in my church. And it was, well, how do you make sure they don't come from China? I said, because we'll look at where they're coming from and we'll try and build that into the process. Um, and thankfully, somebody said, oh, you can get these ones and they're, they're made in the UK. Um, so I think, as with all things, you try and do the due diligence as you're going down the road. Um, now, I'm, I'm losing track of the next questions and what, what was there, because I didn't have a pen to write stuff down. Um, can anybody remember the next ones that we were on? The, the engagement, certainly, I think, when, you, when you're the size of the church commissioners, you can do it. When you're the size of our diocese, then we still can't. Where we can have engagement is with the fund managers. And that, the example there was with M&G where we decided to actually, no, you're not giving us what we want. We've been asking you for two years. We're going. Um, when we come back to the, uh, the, the options that we took in terms of the insurance, I'll come to the insurance last, the, the, the litigation side of it, it's not even on our radar at the moment as a risk. However, having said that, um, we were very careful when we were selecting our new fund managers. 
and we, we went through um, and we did a desk review on about six managers, looked at their ESG credentials, looked at the way they were operating, we invited two, and as I said, we liked both of them, so we actually took some money and in, in invested in, in both of them, and they were very high on the ESG side of it and we were and it wasn't just the renewable side they were looking at things like the social justice the recruitment policies of these these companies so they had to be a good company to start with in terms of a good investment risk uh, and potential but also then they were they were putting the add-ons to it um and, and i think from a diocese point of view i'd be saying that's that's as much as we can do bearing in mind we are run by uh, a committee that is entirely volunteers um, operating on a quarterly basis. You have to place reliance on some people. Um, in terms of the insurance, we do look at insurance. Uh, we, we went out to, to broker again and we have changed some of our insurances, particularly on, on the land side. Um, but it, it's, it's another supplier that we would look at. Uh, and I'm not sure if I've sort of scratched my head and said I wasn't quite sure whether I've answered your question or not, um, or whether I've completely missed it. So I'm going to pass over to Paul. <laughs> <laughs> you let me know if I missed it. Um, yeah, just to think of things to, to, to add, um, I think Rebecca's comment on an engagement I mean yeah there are obviously different ways to to engage um, and it's obviously great to see that impact can be made it doesn't actually matter what the percentage of, of ownership is um, our, our view overall is that you know rel relative to the to the institutional investors we're, we are we are small investors as the the um, church commissioners, but our voice is loud. It's louder than our than our amount. And you know, um, you know when we, when, for example, we made a decision on oil and gas, that did have a disproportionate probably knock on effect. Um, and we do get, you know, if, if if we if we say we're not happy with something or we want to understand more, we we do believe that we we get in, engagement. And this isn't my area of expertise on company engagement, but I believe that we get a better um, conversation when we remain invested proportionately um, and I guess that's just speaking for the, the, the church commissioners um, I think Mike uh, took the, the question on batteries um, and, and I guess the same would apply to, to solar and when you buy an electric car etc and I you know um, there are ways you can check but also it's it's probably fair to say supply chains and you know downstreams are really hard and most you know a lot of materials come from China and they become very hard to track. And does that make it right? No. Um, but there's a balance, I guess, between taking action that we can to improve the renewable energy we have and you know, doing what we can to understand those um, supply chains. Um, and I'm afraid I, the insurance bit, probably not my, I, I probably haven't got anything um, Re really useful to add, although I would say when I, the question was started, I thought it might go down the, in America there are now, you know, I think it's generally from America, there are lawsuits going in that are stopping ESG um, principles being put into investment because it's a fiduciary duty, you know, how, you know, how can you collaborate with your competitors? How could, you know, I guess in, in my world, the church commissioners talk to the Duchy of Cornwall about, you know, how to make farms better because you could be, um, you know, you could be sharing your, you know, IP, so to speak. And that's, that's something that, you know, we've, we've become alert to um, as well, which is another, uh, you know, a layer of this, of this conversation. Um, albeit an answer to that is we believe that most of the investments that our managers make and that people do in climate solutions you know, are financially justifiable too. So they do, you know, like, like with our general approach, they, they do work, but it's, it's um, amazing the type of lawsuits that are now coming in at, from different directions, um, yeah. Fantastic. Just, I think in relation to your comment, Rebecca, around small investors, it is something that we are going to be covering in our third panel um, after lunch. Um, so hopefully that will speak to your comment as well, that panel. 
Um, I, I think just, just interesting, a lot of the conversations around um, batteries and, and solar panels and so on, I think sometimes we often forget around looking just at general consumption levels. And, you know, this being part and parcel of the conversation about how we invest and where we invest. And that almost being kind of a starting point, um, I, I think, as well. Are there any final questions before we wrap up for lunch or general comments? This is a slightly different one. I'm um, a member of Christian Climate Action, so we're an activist group. To what extent does our activism influence your decision making? Because um, we what have what? our actions, the actions we take, influence what you do. Because obviously we, we, we've been campaigning for a while about um, church commissions to divesting, but also about um, dioceses divesting. I think shortly we're going to be looking at dioceses and who they bank with. Um, so what, to what extent do, does our activism influence what you do? Um, when I was preparing for this, I went back over my laptop and looked at various things. And at a 2018 event in Truro on um, uh, climate and uh, all that side of it, I was asked to speak on disinvestment. And I was given an Operation NOAA leaflet that I'd never heard of. Never heard of Operation NOAA. And I looked at it and said, well, that's not right. We're much better engaging. <laughs> and so quite a bit of what I was talking about there was engaging. Uh, rather than disinvesting. And over the time, as you listen to more and you, you've, you've been on various sessions, my, my view has changed. And I'm um, you know, thinking, actually, no, a little bit like the church commissioners, I, I looked at what they did with ExxonMobil and said, well, that, that's great, they've got this through, they've got that through, despite them, the company not wanting it. Um, but then it gets to the point where you think, no, these guys aren't serious, you've just got to walk away from them. Um, I am, um, it's, it's quite sad actually, I, I love David Attenborough and my wife and I have been watching series on David Attenborough but it got to the end where she said this is depressing because at the end he says and this is a problem and all the knock on and it, it's, um, it gets very difficult when it comes across as just being doom and gloom all the time. We need, <laughs> we need your wife to come to <laughs> and, and give us the hope but I think it does. I'm slightly sceptical, without getting too political, about some of the actions that, that activist groups take as to whether actually they're doing more harm than good. Um, and I raised that question at an event at New Wine. Um, but I was told actually it looks as though it does actually raise the question and is successful, even if unpopular. And, and so I think, yes, we need to keep on banging on about it and we just don't stop because it, you, know, you just keep repeating the message and hopefully it'll get there. Uh, it's, it's a good question. Um, the the church commissioners, as uh, you know, before my, uh, I've been in the church commissioners for eighteen months. My the the tale I get told is that I, uh, X number of years ago, five whatever, there was very much that was the, the royal family say never never explain, never put your head above the parapet. Sorry, that's not the the right phrase, but you know what I mean. So. Um, so I guess that's how we were, a, a, a quiet organisation that didn't want to speak publicly um, and went about its business. Um, was it, has activism helped, you know, increase the amount of change that is now, you know, that has been in the church commissioners, jobs like mine existing? Of, it must do, I, you know, of course. Of course that people challenging questioning, asking, you know, reasonable questions about what you are doing and how you do it, does that allow you to organize your thoughts better and make better decisions? I think the answer is yes. Um, I do agree with Mike's point about, um, and it, as, as a general, where you have good will, good intentions, and people trying to do their best at what point activism can actually hurt intentions. Um, and I, that's not specific to the church commissioners, um, but I, you know, you can, I guess, as a as a as a, as a slight example uh, to one side is uh, carbon credits. Now, I, you, people have different views on it. Um, there is effectively a lot of private money that is looking to invest in climate solutions in one form or another. Most of them, or sorry, let's say it doesn't matter the number. A lot of them will be very well good intention, there will be some that are just looking to greenwash. Um, when articles are published that 
that bundle everything in together, it makes it harder for companies to act because they are very, very scared of, of any negative press around what they might do. Um, and that's not specific to the church commissioners, but I just it's just it's interesting examples of um, to Mike's point of where you where it can go too far. And I would say generally we really value positive and productive engagement, and we value where we where we try our best to explain what's going on. We really do value the that engagement, um, especially where it you know we um, you know we can keep working keep working relationships. I'm just going to add one last thing. Um, our environment policy is cherish creation, cut carbon, speak up. And the reason I'm here is not because we're the only diocese doing things, but actually part of our policy is speak up. And so we were putting out press releases. We were saying, yes, we'll do this. We were, yes, I'll come on this session. Yes, I'll do that. Um, and Bishop Hugh leads the environment. He's been doing the same. So actually speaking up is a key part of what we need to be doing, and we should all be doing it. Thank you so much. That was fantastic. Thank you, Paul, and thank you, Mike. Julia? Thank, thank you to all three. Thank you. Thank you.